broadcast is part of the IC Robots Radio Network. Visit icrobots.com for this and many other nerd slash nostalgia related podcasts. You won't be sorry for long. to the Toys R Us report, recorded live on Jupiter's third largest moon, Callisto. Like Rick James, he kicks game and spits flame. He's your host, Icy Robots. Greetings, Earth people. I am from Jupiter. It is me again, Icy Robots. I am not a hero, but I do sacrifice a bit of my week each and every week to make your week a bit less weak. And this week, it is going to get so much, so much less weak. We're going to, uh, we're going to talk about the movie. Everybody's talking about a movie known as... The Justice League, we are going to uh, have a visit from Iceberg. We're back on the station and we are going to be doing, we're going to be doing all we can to make life as normal as it can be, considering everything that's going on. So with all that said, why don't we get the jump off jumping with the brand new jam from uh, Engineer Emily and the Ensign over in Pod B. Let me see. Let me see if I can find that. I know I got it here on the drive. I should really have these things queued up. I'm sorry. It's taking a second to load. Here we go. Here it is. toys than the other guys do. I hear when you go, you can't take it with you. But I'm all like, what the heck? I don't even care. I got all my stuff and I don't want to share. I got mini mates, Migos, Joes and all that. I got He-Man, Trapjaw and two Battle Cats. Castle, Grey School, Nerf Balls and two Whiffle Bats. I got Low Light, Snake Eyes and the Dude Tunnel Rat. I'm afraid I've got some bad news. You are listening to the Toys R Us report. That's pretty bad news. That's about as bad as it can get. Yes, you are listening to you are listening to the greatest podcast in the world, the Toys R Us report. We are we are back up on the Jupiter Moon base. We we've been down on Earth base one for a while now, but I felt like felt like it was time to try to get back to normal time to try to get back to work i have the the clouds have been knocked away from my eyes and i can finally finally start to see the sun again if that makes any sense i hope it does but uh with everything going on you know it's it's been hard but it's time dude it's time to try to time to try to smile again and have some fun so i came back up here it's been you know it's been like it is i've been doing the vents watching out for moon rats all that all that kind of stuff, and I was lucky enough to bump into the dude himself, Iceberg13, who has, he has been big enough to take on some of my responsibilities while I've been down handling other, other important duties on the Earth base, so let me get homie in here, and we're gonna see, uh, we're gonna see what he's been up to, what's been jumping off, Iceberg, come on in. Yo, Iceberg, dude, nice to see you, man, what's going on, hey, you don't have to run, dude, slow down. Why do you keep the chair so far away from the door and why is this room so large? It makes no sense for a recording booth to be in such a large open room. You obviously know nothing about audio engineering. I mean, not really. This is just, you know, the only room that was available. I I, I tried to find a smaller space, but this is, you know, there's only like five rooms in the pod, dude. I guess that is true. This building is not that big. Nope, it's uh, it's not that not that big at all. Uh, this is, you know, this is not working out as well as I thought. Uh, say something, Iceberg. What's this I hear about your house burning down? Is that why you've left me here alone to do all the work? Dude, my house didn't burn down, and that's not even not even funny to say. It was it was a scary situation. Why why would you even say something like that? Say something like what? 
All you talked about on the stupid show is that file. It was so boring. I can't imagine why anyone listens when I am not on. It's all about boring stuff. I don't think any of it's boring, and I talked about more than the fire. It's... it's the show's not boring, dude. It's like a slice of life, you know, just like letting people know what I, you know, what I'm up to. I don't, I don't know, man. What, the only parts that are boring are when you're on, to be honest. You are just saying that to try and hurt my feelings, which makes me think you are lashing out because I said the show is boring. What? That means I win the argument. How? I have damaged your feelings. <laughs> Dude, you don't win an argument by hurting somebody's feelings. Really? How do you think you win an argument then? You win an argument by, like, saying a better point, you know, a point that proves that you are correct or whatever, not by, not by hurting someone's feelings. I believe that you are incorrect. Oh yeah? H how so? If you damage someone's feelings, you weaken them, perhaps permanently, and if you can do that, you win. It is a simple theory. <laughs> Dude, that is one of the literally worst things that I've ever heard. You, when you get into an argument, your, your mission is to hurt somebody's feelings, perhaps permanently scar them. That, that is so twisted. What is wrong with you? There is not one thing wrong with me. I ran a diagnostic earlier and it said that I was super dope. Can you say the same? Mm, probably not. Exactly. Listen, I have no feelings. You cannot hurt me with your feeble words. Air for I win every argument before they have even begun. I am perfect. Well, I don't know about all that, dude. I mean, I've seen you get your feelings hurt before. Remember when when you thought that uh, A.B. Silver died? Dude, you were in like a psychiatric hospital for robots. Don't don't try to say that you don't have feelings, man. That's, that's not even true. Since that time, I have added code to my programming that has given me a heart of steel. Wasn't your heart made of steel already, though, dude? Yes, it is. But the code has toughened up my inner heart to steel as well. I feel nothing. Like I said, I am perfection personified. I think you meant, uh, perfection personified. And dude, you obviously feel something. You, you feel pride. You are, like, so proud of yourself for, uh, this new code. That is permitted. I have written that in as well. I think of everything. Maybe, but, dude, you need feelings. Why do you want to go through life, like, all unfeeling? What about the, the other good feelings? You know, like, joy and love and all those other things, man. Don't you, uh, don't you want to feel those? No, I do not. I have better things to do. I mean, like what, dude? All I ever see you do is hang out over in the snack shack and play Punch-Out. That is a better use of my time than feeling joy. But don't you feel joy when you're playing Punch-Out and you're just like knocking out uh, King Hippo or Bald Bull or whatever? No, not one bit. If you don't play to have fun and like have joy or whatever, what do you play for? I play it so that the time will pass so that I will be closer to the date I will be powered down. You play so that you'll be closer to the day you power down. You're basically like playing video games and sitting around and waiting to die, Iceberg. This has, this has been an enlightening talk. Uh, you know, you don't want to go through life just like playing video games and waiting to die, man. There, there's more, you know, like, I don't know, like going to the movies or whatever. Anyway, let's, uh, Iceberg, thanks for dropping by. This has been a hoot. You are welcome. It was not a hoot for me. Well, man, thanks, uh, thanks for letting me know that. So, let's, uh, let's move into the next segment of the show at the movies where we're going to talk about the, uh, eagerly awaited Justice League joint. <laughs> In a moment, at the movies, without Ebert, Siskel, or even that dude Roper. But you got Icy Robot, so that's something, right? Here's the thing. It's really cool. You guys seem ready to do battle. I've never done battle. I'm just pushing. 
push some people and run away. Save one. Save one person. And then you go. Yes, it was gross. Justice League. November. November. November is here. It is now. We are we are getting to the end of November, so there is that. It's always it's always fun when you've been waiting for a movie to come out, when you've been hearing about a movie for like seemingly ever and ever. I have been waiting for like ever and ever for this movie to come out. And it's finally it's finally out. It's out now. I saw it and let me uh let me tell you what I think. We went to see it early, early on the Sunday that it came out. I I like to see movies early. I say that all the time. I want to see them during the day when it's like a bit less crowded. That's just me, man. I want a nice somewhat silent arena if at all possible so I can like sit back and enjoy everything that's going on, but a lot of people were also coming out to see this. The the movie did $96 million opening weekend, which is considered a disappointment for a movie of this stature, but still, that's a, that's a ton of money. They won the weekend, so there were a lot of people there. The showing that we went to was in the in the big theater, Theater 13, the big, the big monster. It's not an IMAX or anything, but it is the biggest theater, so that's going to be your your best experience for a big movie like this. So... Let's, uh, let's get down to the, the, uh, brass tacks of it. I saw it, and I liked it. I liked it just fine. I thought it was alright. It was, it was okay. It had some good parts. I did, I did zone out for some parts of the movie, but, uh, let's, let's kind of get into the details. This is gonna be spoiler-free as much as I possibly can, but I, I may point out some plot details and stuff, but nothing like... Nothing that I think will uh, spoil your enjoyment of the movie. This is this is basically the tale of Bruce Wayne, who is uh, you know Batman, played by Ben Affleck, is going out there and trying to recruit the Justice League for a preventative measure against a alien invasion. That's you know basically the that's basically the basic story of the whole thing. He's trying to get Aquaman. Wonder Woman, Cyborg, and put them all together to have the best chance to defeat this alien invasion. It's always, it's always an invasion of some sort. These movies always have, they always have a villain problem. The heroes themselves are so powerful that it would take an army to defeat them. So they are always fighting an army of some sort. So... It's like a video game where you have to, like, defeat enemy after enemy after enemy after enemy. Little small fights, one punch fights to get to the, to get to the big end boss. The, the way they tell stories in video games has definitely affected the way that, the way that movies are written nowadays. They go for that end boss style of movie, and this is another end boss style of movie, but... I definitely did have a good time watching this. I think that Ben Affleck is a really good Batman. And I know that there's there's some kind of deal where he wants out of the role. He wants out or whatever. But I do think that he is a good Batman. And I think that uh, Jeremy Irons is a terrific Alfred. And I would, I'd like to see more of this uh, performance out of him. I'm, I'm interested. He... He sort of has that uh, D-bag style of Bruce Wayne down to, down to a T. He has it, he has it captured. This is another one of those where Batman is wearing heavy armor. I myself, I would like to see Batman in something lighter. I realize that it isn't realistic, but that helmet head, the way that he can't turn his head so, so freely, that helmet head Sort of does me in. I realize you're going into battle. You would definitely want to wear a helmet on your head. But in the Batman versus Superman movie, there was there was like a dream sequence, and in it, Batman has a he has a CGI hood the whole time. But in using the CGI, they were able to give it like a real fabricy kind of look, which I enjoyed. I would like to see more of that, but that's that's just like a nitpicky 
kind of kind of thing. Aquaman is a new character in the uh, DC movie universe. He's played by played by Jason Momoa. I don't um I don't have a ton of familiarity with Jason Momoa. I know him from Game of Thrones. I don't know if that is. His only major credit, but that is where I know him from. He's the leader of the Dothraki horde. He's the, uh, is he the Khaleesi? I forget. He's something like that. He's, I, I don't know the exact title. I watch Game of Thrones, but a lot of it, um, there's so much, there's so much trivia involved with Game of Thrones that I can't keep, I can't keep everything straight all the time, but he, he's from that, and he has an interesting take on Aquaman, the... The thing is with good old Arthur Curry, good old Aquaman with the with the classic uh, green pants, orange shirt, uniform that we all know. Dude does not exactly have a defined personality, to be honest. If you asked me what the what the traits of Aquaman were, I would say that he wears an orange shirt and that he can talk to sea creatures. But if you asked me like what he was like as a person or what his what his dynamic is, I would have no idea. So that that gave Momoa like a freedom to sort of go nuts with it. He he's like I wouldn't say like a surfer dude, but he is sort of playing it like he's kind of a laid back dude saying stuff like, I dig it, or what's up, dude? What's up, bro? That kind of that kind of thing. And I myself, I wasn't like I wasn't so in into it, but the wife and 2.0, they thought that he was really funny, and I would imagine that has something to do with his uh, dynamic abs. But they dug him, so who am I to say? And I didn't not, I didn't not dig him. I just didn't dig him the most out of uh, all of the crew. But he's, you know, he's doing something with it. He's taking it in a direction, and I appreciate that. And there is another thing that I definitely appreciate that he's playing Aquaman like he's a good guy. He is definitely like a bit rough around the edges but he's not conflicted he is he's a good guy he's a superhero they go down to atlantis you see mira his wife played by amber heard and she looks pretty good in her uh atlantean queen outfit he's down there for a bit so he had kind of a little bit of a peek and then there is ezra miller who you might know from uh perks of being a wallflower he is a favorite around our house 2.0 is her favorite movie of all the times is Perks of Being a Wallflower. And so she was looking forward to seeing him the most in the movie. He has an interesting take on good old Barry Allen, a.k.a. The Flash. His take on The Flash is basically the dude is dude's kind of a spaz, I guess, is how I would put it. He's kind of weird, you know. He sort of gets overly excited and he acts like a dork. But he's a very, very likable character. He has most of... Most of the funny lines through the feature, he was one of the shining lights, I would say. Definitely one of the characters that you're going to enjoy. And seeing this, I I would have to say I am looking forward to the solo Flash movie. I mean, I was going to go see it anyway when it comes out, but now, I, now I'm a bit looking forward to it. Definitely, definitely a fun take on the character. I'm not so not so sold on his uniform it's kind of armor plated i i sort of prefer the cw grant gustin leather one but again that's just you know nitpicky costume stuff it's not really affecting the overall movie the effects of him running are really good you get an idea of how fast he really is i think that a lot of times on the cw they don't get across the idea of how fl- how fast the Flash would actually be if he was real life, in real life, like, occasionally somebody will catch him with a punch, and I'm thinking, it's just impossible, you would never, ever catch the Flash with a punch, and in this, you, uh, you see how fast it would be, you know, to actually be able to travel in the, uh, in the legendary Speed Force. Then there is Cyborg, the, the half-man, half-machine when I was coming up as a youth reading comics, Cyborg was sort of a new jack superhero in my mind. He was a new creation who hadn't really earned his props yet, but dude has been around long enough, and I was thinking about this too. 2.0 has had Cyborg in her life the entirety of her existence. She used to watch Teen Titans Go or whatever it was, and she's been seeing this guy as long as she's been seeing Superman or Batman. As far as she knows, he's one of he's one of the main eventers. So I'm gonna have to say 
You finally made it, Cyborg. You are now in the main event. You are an accepted member of the Justice League, dude. You finally made it. He is half man, half machine, as as we all know from watching Teen Titans Go. And in the movie, he has a jagged period. He's more appearance, rather. He is more rounded off in the comics. In this, he's he's very jagged, but the Design is super similar to how he looks in the old George Perez Teen Titan books or in the Teen Titans Go, which I keep going back to. It's so weird. This dude was a complete and total New Jack superhero, but it's like now I can think there are off the top of my head three or four different toys with a Cyborg. I know she has a couple variant Cyborg figures from the Teen Titan lines. She has a bobblehead of Cyborg. Cyborg's made it. I'm I'm glad, man, you, you did your... You did your time, you bid your you bid your apprenticeship, and now you're in the Justice League, and good for you, dude. He has some interesting powers. He can, besides being a super powerful half-man, half-robot, he can interface with computers and do all sorts of neat stuff. He's going to have to be fleshed out a bit more, I think, as a actual character, but for a first-ever appearance on something like this, it... It's fine. And then there's Wonder Woman. Wonder Woman is the shining light of the DC movie universe by far. Gal Gadot is so good with this role that you just fully accept that she is Wonder Woman. She is pure. She is brave. She is cool. She's all that good stuff. She is what Superman should be in this universe. And... I I don't know, man. I am in 100% on Gal Gadot as Wonder Woman. There's a scene that has a bit of controversy, as I understand it. They're back on Amazon Island for a scene, and some of the Amazons have a midriff exposing a uniform that they didn't have in the Wonder Woman feature, but <laughs> these chicks have the most chiseled abs I've ever seen. These, these abs put uh, good old Jason Momoa to shame if it was an ab off. They're for sure winning, and if I myself had abs like that, I have abs nothing like that, but if I did, I would definitely want them preserved on film for all eternity, because all you gotta do, all you gotta do is have those abs the one time people see you on film, and then for the rest of your life, they'll just assume that's what you look like. Just never, never show your stomach again, and they'll assume that you have a, uh, have a 12-pack abs with the, uh, with the vein showing, so... Let's see. Oh, this isn't a spoiler to any major degree, but Superman returns in the film. We all know this. We've all seen footage of uh, Henry Clavel filming with that with a mustache that they had to CGI out. And look, more power to Henry Clavel. I have nothing against the dude. I think he's a fine ant- actor. He is, you know, a supermodel handsome Brit, but um, I don't. I don't think that Henry Clavel has it to be Superman, and I think we've tried to do this like a million times already, and I don't think it's his fault. I think it's the material that he's been given up until this point, but sadly, having seen Henry Clavel do this bad Superman material for so long, he's become, to some degree, tainted meat, and... I I feel for him. It's not his fault. He is out there doing his best to be Superman, but they're just, they're giving him this material where Superman is, he's having always like a crisis of conscience. You know, he doesn't, he doesn't know where he fits in the world. He's not the, he's not the Superman that we want. He is not the Superman that we want. And it's, it's sad, but I was thinking that this has been going on for a while now. And that means there's been a whole generation of kids who've grown up without, without the purity, without the light, without all of that stuff that Superman gave me when I was a kid. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to be real right now. When I was younger, the Christopher Reeve Superman movies were a highly motivating factor to me. They gave me something to look at when I was at a point where I was deciding what kind of person I wanted to be, if that makes any sense. And I saw Chris Reeves being Superman, and I saw that that was a direction that I wanted to go. I'm not saying I'm a superhero, I am nothing like that, but I do definitely try to be a good person as much as I can, and a lot of that has to do with Superman and with comic books. And I think that 
it's important to have these morally virtuous characters out there that we can all reach out for and that we can all strive for so that they can teach us a proper way to live our lives. And it's sad to see this somewhat morally indecisive Superman for a whole generation. Now, we are able to reach out to Wonder Woman for this. She's virtuous, she's brave, and she's all those things that we should strive to be. But it's sad that the kids don't have the Kryptonian. They don't have Superman. They don't have that. I I feel for them. I legitimately feel for them. And I hope that at some point they do they do correct this because he's just such a pillar. He was such a pillar of my life, Superman. And it's sad for me to see what the dude has become today. And overall, I'm going to say I enjoyed the movie. I did enjoy it. Some of some of the battles are very CGI heavy. It's almost like the movie becomes a cartoon at certain points. And that's not my favorite style of cinema. But I do realize that in a superhero battle, it's going to look like a cartoon anyway. Because dudes are flying around shooting beams out of their eyes. And what's it going to be? It's going to look realistic? I don't know. But I did zone out a lot for that. But... There was a lot that I liked. I liked a lot of the character development. It was interesting to see some new dudes on the screen that I haven't seen before. You know, Aquaman, The Flash, Cyborg. That was all fun. It was fun to see some more Wonder Woman. But overall, the movie is... It's only alright. And I think that right now on Rotten Tomatoes, it is... With with the critics, with the critics now, it is at 40%. Certified Rotten. But with the peeps, with the me's and the you's... It's 85%, so folks, by and large, are enjoying that, so take that. Take that for whatever it's worth, but with all that said, on the good old-fashioned Source Magazine, Mike Meter with one being a dud and five being an all-time classic, I am going to give the Justice League three Three mics. mics. Three mics. Doug McCoy, and I like podcasts about the things that interest me. So what interests me? Movies from the 80s, anthology TV shows, and just a bunch of random junk like the Atari 2600, the Nintendo, comic books, and all that good stuff from my childhood. So if you are interested in the things I'm interested in, come to McCoycast.wordpress.com or find the podcast on iTunes and Stitcher. made it this far it's time the final segment the icy robot radio pop culture slash toy news slash other boring stuff informational moment all right my dudes let me uh let me get down with it this is the final segment of the show the one in which we talk about a Random assortment of stuff comic book stuff toy stuff TV stuff whatever whatever uh Whatever comes up, let's start off with start off with the good news. I want to say what's up to my man Gabe, who recently became a show patron. He signed up over at supportthereport.com, where for as small an amount as a dollar a month, you can help us out a whole bunch. And Gabe, Gabe did so, so I gotta I gotta give it up to him. He's a Facebook friend of mine, real real good dude. What else is what else is popping off? Oh, I want to say what's up to Carlos over at uh, Geek Fest Rants. I got to give it up to him too. He he's been in the podcast game for seven years in a row. Can you believe that? It was it was his seventh anniversary just uh, just a while back, and he put out a great episode about that. The entire history of the show was run down. Real good stuff. Check that out over at uh, icrobots.com. You can get that on our feed. You can get that over at geekfestrants.com. That's his feed. What else? What else is popping off? I have been watching a show known as Starcade over on uh, over on Shoutcast on my Roku. That's a Roku channel that I have. I imagine that it's available on the uh, you know the good old internet as well. I mean everything. Everything is everything that's available somewhere else is probably available on the internet. 
in some sense. But what but what Starcade is is an arcade based game show. There are two contestants who are competing for the chance to win an actual arcade cabinet of their very own and the way that they compete is they have a round where they answer video game trivia questions and then they like play the games a bit and they have to beat each other's scores. I don't know. I've only I've only really seen a few so I am not completely like 100% down with the format off the top of my head, but it's pretty fun. There were there were like so many more arcade games than I remember because in each game they have five or six different games that the people can pick to compete in and some of these are games I have like never heard of in my entire life. The show ran from 1982 to 1984. I do recall being aware that it existed at the time it was out, but I don't think I ever saw more than a couple episodes. When I was younger, I would go through periods where I wasn't watching very much TV at all. I was outside doing stuff, and then there were other periods where all I was doing was watching TV, so I missed out on a lot of things, and a lot of things kind of flew by my uh, my awareness altogether. The grand prize in each episode is an actual arcade cabinet, and they uh, compete like crazy for this thing. They they want it super bad. I myself, I have an arcade cabinet. I have Miss Pac-Man in the, in the garage of the Earth base, and at first, it was great having it, but then one day, just out of the blue, within like a couple years of having it, it stopped working. It turns on and the screen is all weirded out and stuff. It does power on, the monitor turns on. I imagine I have to replace some kind of chips or something. I do not know anything about this at all. I read I read Rob O'Hara's book about collecting video games, and in it he said, don't get into video games unless you want to also get into repairing video games. And I got into it without wanting to repair video games, so I just have a Miss Pac-Man machine in my garage. I... I want to, um, I thought about turning it into a multicade. I think I've talked about that before. I would take all the guts out and set them aside in a safe container in case somebody eventually wanted to put them back together. But I have thought about stripping the innards and turning it into some kind of like a multicade like they have over at a, at Juice Shack. But again, I'm too lazy to even do that. I'm not, um, I'm not like a super, super handy guy that way. And I... I don't know. I should do that. That would be fun. If I had the multicade set up in the garage, I would... I'd probably play it all the time. Our garage is pretty neat down there on the Earth base. You can definitely get around, and you can definitely enjoy the things that are in there. The show, Starcade, it's on Shoutcast. It's totally free. It's great. I recommend at least checking out a couple episodes. It's fun just to see, like, the retro fashions and stuff. It's fun, man. The contestants are all weird, which is cool, too. What else? Uh... I've been reading a comic called Jughead the Hunger. It is an Archie horror comic. Archie horror usually uh, comes out with some successful books. And this one is pretty fun too. In it, Jughead, whose last name is Jones, comes from a long line of werewolves. And Betty, whose last name is Cooper, comes from a long line of werewolf hunters known as the Coopers. There was a one-shot a while back that I talked about where Jughead turns into a werewolf and he kills a bunch of guys and flees the town. Well, this is, this is Betty and Archie out there pursuing Jughead. It's cool, man. I highly recommend it. If you read comics, check out Jughead the Hunger. It's cool. It has really neat, like, moody art. It's very similar to the Afterlife with Archie, which I thought was, I thought that was terrific, and this is right in line with that. You'll, you'll dig it the most. While we're on the topic of comics, this was, this was kind of brought to my attention by Gino Vega. He, he mentioned that the move of Brian Michael Bendis from Marvel to DC that we, that we talked about last week was, Very similar to during the Attitude Era of WWF slash WCW War when Vince Russo, the mastermind behind the WWF's writing team or the so-called thought of at the time super wizard behind the writing team jumped from WWF to WCW. At the time, people weren't sure if this was going to be the final nail in the coffin of the WWF, but it turned out that having having Russo leave was the best thing that ever happened, and they were able to get into a bunch of 
new ideas that they may not have thought of before. And Gino Vega got me thinking that maybe this, this Bintis jump could turn out possibly like that. What if he, what if him jumping over to DC is the thing that Marvel needs? He's been, he's been the top dude over there for a while and maybe not necessarily on purpose, but his ideas might keep other people's ideas down. Like, they want to go with the Bendis idea because it's a proven proven idea winner champion there. So maybe some of the other ideas don't, they don't get the chances that they would. And maybe now, with him out of the way, maybe they will get the chance. I don't know. Maybe without him there, everything will fall apart and the company will go out of business. I don't know. Any number of things can happen. Also... While we're still on comics, Mark Miller announced that he is going to be coming out with a new edition of Kick-Ass. I myself, I am a fan of the Kick-Ass comic. It's totally violent. It's totally dumb. But I, I think it's a lot of fun to read. The movies are okay too. I don't love them. But I do enjoy the, I do enjoy the Kick-Ass comic. In this one, the kid who has been, he's been Kick-Ass up until this point will not be involved. This is a new story of a, of a single mom who goes out there and for whatever reason becomes Kick-Ass. I, I myself am looking forward to that. I've already contacted Tatiana over at Comics for the Win and asked her to pull it for me. I don't, I don't know when it's coming out. It's coming out sometime. So keep your eye out. When I get it, I'll let you know so that you can go get it for yourself. If it's any good, I'll read it first and then I'll let you know. What else? is popping off over at the uh over at the CW network they announced the premiere date of Black Lightning it's going to be um January let me look up my notes January 16 of next year it's going to be on a Tuesday it's going to air right after right after the flash i myself am looking forward to this i am a fan of black lightning i wish that the show was inside the berlanti verse it's not going to be the case so i am a little bit i am a little bit bummed out about that i tend to not keep up with supergirl as much as the other shows because it's outside of the Berlanti timeline, so I don't watch it as much as the other ones. I I tend to get behind and watch a bunch in a row because the other ones I know I have to I have to maintain an order. So I I stay tighter on them, and I hope that this doesn't happen to Black Lightning. I would have just gone ahead and put him in the universe. I would go ahead and put everybody in the universe. I think that it's more fun that way. I was I was super into Black Lightning when I was a youth. I went through this period where I got into like black exploitation entertainment a whole lot. I started off watching Shaft and I moved on to like Truck Turner and then to Blackula, Blackenstein, Zulu, Gestapo, all these other weird black exploitation movies. Anything that had like black and then the version of it. I was I was into that scene for a while. I really appreciated like the gorilla style of the of the filmmaking. It was so so gritty and raw. I dig that uh when you give it to me, give it to me raw kinda kinda stuff. And I I thought Black Lightning was cool. He was like a black exploitation character, but in comics. And I am excited to see that good old Jefferson Pierce is gonna get his own TV show. It, it could be it could be super cool. I I have uh I have high hopes for it. So far so far none of the like these like Berlanti shows have been bad. There hasn't been like a real clunker yet. They they keep knocking him out of the park over there at the CW. I, I'm all for it. They are they're gearing up for a big crossover event soon. It's like the Crisis on Earth X, I think is the title. If I am remembering correctly, and I hope that I am, Earth X is the DC multiverse Earth that has a history where the Nazis have, in fact, won the war. Good thing. Still connected to the... Uh, AOL here. Let's just, I'm away from the microphone a little bit, so I hope that you can hear me just fine. I am, you know, still connected to the AOL, so I'm gonna look it up and we're going to see. Earth X is, in fact, the parallel Earth in which the Nazis won the war, so I'm looking forward to that. They're gonna have a scene with a guaranteed 20 superhero characters in it at one time, so that could be cool. As I gather the, uh, our guys, the Arrow, you know, Supergirl, all these folks are going to be fighting Nazi versions of themselves. I don't know if they will go ahead and be Nazis. Nazis are a bit hardcore. They may just be like some kind of fascist rulers from another dimension, but they will be fighting 
fascist ruler versions of themselves. And that that certainly seems like a lot of fun. I've already seen images of the of the evil Supergirl, and she looks pretty cool. I don't know. I'm looking forward to it, man. Their big crossover event of the year is always always a hoot. The invasion last year was a, was a lot of fun. I, I enjoyed that. I don't know what else. What else is going on? It has been announced that uh, that the Rock La Roca will be starring as the as the lead villain in the Suicide Squad for the uh, sequel to the much maligned Suicide Squad movie. Dude's gonna be Black Adam at first. It was thought that he was going to be playing Black Adam in the Shazam movie. But then then the announcement of the Shazam movie kind of came and went with no announcement of The Rock. And as it turns out, La Roca is going to be in... It's going to be in the Suicide Squad. Black Adam is... He's the evil version of Shazam, Captain Marvel, I would say. He wears all black. He is, he's from the days of ancient Egypt, and he's been alive ever since. He has the powers of a god. He is, like, unthinkably powerful. He is, he's like Superman, but without the weakness for magic, because he has magic, and he is, he's completely evil. I don't even know how he could... How he could be in a Suicide Squad movie. If he got if he got his hands on anybody in the Suicide Squad, he's just gonna tear him to shreds, limb from limb. There isn't anybody in the Suicide Squad that could hang and clang with Black Adam for even even a millisecond. I mean, Harley Quinn has a bat, uh Deadshot has a gat. I don't I don't know, man. Nobody could hang with Bro for even maybe the Enchantress. I don't know the I don't know like the outer limits of her abilities, but I guess she's not even in it anymore anyway, so I don't know, man. They, they're they going to be up for a uh, tough row ahead of them when they, when they get to the uh, good old Black Adam battle. And uh, I got I got a fire story. I know we're, we're trying to get to the end of those. We're trying to, like, brush that off and move forward. But this one, this one ties into a story that we told back in 2015. You can find it in the... In the best of 2015 episode over at over at icrobots.com, it is a story known as A Tale of Two Kayas. It involves me, the neighbor's dog, Kaya, and another dog named Kaya. I don't know if you recall this. It was it was a good story. It's about a German shepherd and how I mistakenly put a completely different dog named Kaya into the neighbor's backyard thinking that it was their dog. Kaya's a good dog, man. She she actually saved the neighbors' lives during the tub fire. They have since they've since moved away from the earth base. They have a they have a spot up on Mark West Spring Road. It's way out in the woods, and this this part of town was absolutely devastated by the fires. And I heard this story from a, a neighbor friend of mine who stayed in contact with them. They were nice folks, but we did lose contact with them when they moved away. But this lady, lady still tight with them. And she was saying that their house was sadly completely destroyed. But when, when the blaze was going on, the family was woken up by Kaya. Kaya barked and she got them up and they were able to all get out of the house for whatever reason, you know, the fire extinguishers weren't going off, the fire alarms weren't going off, rather, and they had no kind of a notification that the house was on fire. And then, you know, Kaya ran through the bedrooms and barked and woke them all up. So, the famous dog from A Tale of Two Kayas. Kaya herself is a, she's a hero, man. That was a good dog. She's a good dog. She she saved, she saved that, that family's lives. It was them and their two kids all got saved by barking Kaya. I heard then that they... They had to run down the street, like when the when they were finally woken up, the entire house was was ablaze, and they weren't even able to get into the family car and escape because the garage was on fire, the roads were blocked off, and the kids and them had to they had to run down the street with um with poor old Kaya. As I understand it, their their cat Bandit didn't make it. That that's been that's been a story of the fire. It seems like there's just so many. So many lost pets, and I know you're supposed to grieve for the people and their lost houses, but man, you know, all these people and their pets, it's just, it's sad, man. There are a lot of displaced cats, a lot of cats didn't make it, a lot of dogs didn't make it, and there's just something sad about hearing a dog meeting its fate, but, uh, I don't know, man. At least we got this heroic tale of Kaya to carry us through. A tale of two Kaya, 
The end result, Kai's a hero. And we are, we're rapidly approaching Thanksgiving. This, this episode comes out on Wednesday, the day before, before Thanksgiving. And I hope that, I hope that you take these tales that I've been, you know, just going over and over and over again about the tub's fire and the destruction. And I hope you, I hope you take them into your heart and you use them to let yourself feel like truly thankful for all that you have. If you have your family and you have friends and you're safe, you have a home, you know, you have people to celebrate with. If you have even just like one person to celebrate with, just one person in the world to celebrate with, you have, you have everything. You have just more than is guaranteed to anybody. And I hope that Hope you have a good holiday. I hope that you are just safe and sound and with your loved ones. And I hope you have some good food. I hope you have some turkey and some potatoes. What is your favorite Thanksgiving food? I myself, I have to admit, I'm not the biggest fan of the traditional holiday foods. I do like turkey. Turkey's good. Turkey and gravy's good. I like biscuits and stuff. But like the sides never do it for me. I'm not a giant mashed potato guy. I don't know. It always, it always comes out that when people make the Thanksgiving vegetable sides, it's I think it's the timing of the dinner, the timing of getting everything ready for the Thanksgiving feast that the veggies get cooked too early. And by the time you get them, they're mushy. You get like mushy beans and just, I don't know, man. I am not the biggest Thanksgiving food fan. It's all, it's all a bit rich and heavy for me, but still I do appreciate the holiday. I do appreciate being with people. I do, I do like turkey, man. You know what I like to do? I like to get, um... I like to take the rolls, like, uh, every year for Thanksgiving, we get those, like, Hawaiian brand rolls, I don't really know the name of the brand, but, like, the container, the packaging is orange, and they're a bit sweet, I love, like, the day after Thanksgiving, getting one of those Hawaiian rolls and putting, like, a piece of turkey in there with, like, a small dab of mayonnaise, more as, like, a lubricant than a flavor, and I just mac down on two or the, two or three of those, like, small little turkey sandwiches, that's, that's my jam. That's my favorite Thanksgiving thing. I like to also maybe put like a pinch of cranberry sauce. I like the real cranberry sauce, but I also like really love that gelatinous tube of cranberry sauce. I could eat that year round. I don't know why I don't. Every year when I have some of that, I always go to the wife. Why don't you just serve this on some random days? I love how tangy and how tart it is. That's just me, but I don't know, man. Maybe it's only great if you have it just that one time, but I think, uh... I think I'm going to sign off, and let's see. Next week, we're going to have a who's who in the DC Comics universe where we are going to talk about uh, Clifford DeVoe, a.k.a. The Thinker, the guy who is the big baddie on The Flash. That's that That's that guy in that chair. We're going to go all through him. We're going to learn about his Silver Age origins. Dude actually comes from, like, 1942. He's been a big thorn in The Flash's side for many, many, many a years, and it's cool to see cool to see one of these wacky Silver Age villains on TV in any form, so until then, this is me Icy Robot, signing off for Iceberg 13, Engineer Emily everybody involved with uh, bringing Icy Robot's radio to you this is the Toys R Us Report, episode number 137 uh, if you don't know now you know This has been an IC Robots Radio production. IC Robots Radio is a listener supported in Deha. If you like what we do and we make your day a little easier, please consider tossing a few bucks our way to help keep the life support running. All money collected goes to help us prepare for future space pirate attacks. Go on over to supportthereport.com for all the details. Thanks and have a great week.